All right, everybody, welcome to the show. Today, our show is very special to me and to millions of people around the world. Today, we're discussing the past, present, and future of the International Scout, something that is very near and dear to us. And our episode today is brought to you by Kenda Tire, the always reliable, quiet, efficient Kenda Cleaver RT. We love it, recommend it. We run it on all of our, I mean, all of our personal rigs and pretty much standard tire on our build. So make sure you check those out. Also, very special mention to the International Scout Encyclopedia, the authoritative guide to IH's legendary 4x4, written by Jim Allen and John Glancy. So those are available at uh, anythingscout.com, superscoutspecialist.com, or just Google. I think they're on Amazon too. So look up International Scout Encyclopedia. It's a super good read, really well done high quality pictures. Uh, You're going to love it. Just read it to your kids, um, grandparents, whoever. Anyway, thanks for the listen. Have a good episode. the new legend podcast where we celebrate vintage four by fours family culture adventure and being a man in the 21st century and today we have a very special episode today the episode is all about the international scout if you're watching on video you can see we have a a a cool book here that we're going to talk about but we are here with a really special guy john glancy so john welcome to the podcast so um So we're going to talk about the Scout, and it's difficult to talk about the Scout without talking about the people that have played a role in preserving and really making the Scout what it is today, in a sense. Um, So let's just start from the beginning. Let's let's, uh, talk to us a little bit about, well, first off, one of the things we always start the podcast with is, what was your, what did it mean to you to get your license? What did that, what did that mean to turn 16? My driver's license? Yeah. Oh, that was really important because I couldn't wait and stole my parents' car and was driving around <laughs> long before I right, got that's my classic, license. Classic, classic. And when I got it, I went out the first day and and uh, you know went to the gas station and and then went to the store and did anything I do, could do to drive. So it just meant freedom, freedom, and opportunity. Absolutely. Now, what was your first car? My first car was a 1974 Chevy Laguna. Laguna, okay, that's, White a, that's a rare with one. The red burgundy trim at the bottom swivel buckets so now nice car one thing we talk a lot about on this podcast is we talk about the future of driving i was just out in the parking lot so we are actually here live at the scout nationals so john puts on this event called the scout nationals how many years has it been going on 30th 30th year wow 30 years that's incredible um and it's just all about celebrating international harvester and particularly the scout and travel alls and and the light line stuff um so I was out in the parking lot and I saw a Tesla. And as we know, those Teslas have autonomous driving. So like, what do you think is going to be the future of driving? Probably hovercraft. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. Yeah. You, you won't have wheels. You won't have tires or rubber touching the ground. And it'll just cruise around in the air. Do you think people will drive? They'll always drive. There will okay. always be muscle cars. There will always be a love for the tire on the road. All right, I don't I like think that. I like it that. will ever end. I like that. Um. And okay, so let's let's bring that into context. Uh, and again, if you're watching this on YouTube, I invite you to watch. We're in a cool setting. We're in the in the setting of the um, the the binder, Great American Binder Build Off. Yep, that's those three behind. So we got some trucks here, but we're nestled here at the Nationals Live. So if you get a chance to watch this on YouTube, check it out. If not, listen to just on uh, audio. Um, so take us back. What is your story? with international harvester my story um my father started with the company in 1940s wow and uh i had two brothers that worked for international dealerships and we always had a travel law in the driveway till 75 when they quit making them dad, really? dad was a travel so law even guy. from like we're talking the early days they had the first travel law which was, was like year? a 53 or 4 and my mother told me that uh the first time they took it out and this was a brand new travel law when they came out. 
uh, it rained and all the seals leaked. Exactly. They, they, so they didn't seal them very well. That actually didn't change very much throughout. Uh, well, they, the they kind of leaked clear up to 75 <laughs> and then right. the scouts too. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you have a long, long history with international harvesters. Yes. So when you had the Chevy Laguna, your family was still an IH kind of family. Oh, yeah. So when was your, what was your first IH vehicle? My first IH vehicle was a 79 Scout that I bought from a salesman uh, at an international branch. And uh, I put quarters on it and took the top off. What year? 79. You bought it in what year? Oh, what year was that? That would have been probably 1983. So this is what's crazy. Yeah. So we're talking a 1979 vehicle. You bought it in 1983, which is four years later, and you right. had to put quarters on it. was rusty. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty That's rough. That's actually very interesting, because we see trucks today that have, like, that need quarters, and, and it's like, ah, it's kind of stinky. But that's actually a pretty special thing, because there's so many scouts that don't exist anymore. Right, they, they rotted away, and people yeah. gave up on them. That's right. So, so let's, because this, this is, a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, they just know of scouts from Instagram or Pinterest. Like, they've just seen them online, maybe seen one or two. Or, and actually, there's quite a few people that have some, some sort of connection. But I, th- I think let's educate the, the uninformed, which is not a bad thing, because no, I was no. uninformed. Actually, I've been in the scout business professionally since 2002, but I grew up in Connecticut, and in Connecticut, there was not a lot of scouts because they all rusted away. Right. And so when I was, I moved, when I was up until the age of 18, I saw one scout in my whole life, and I was like, what is that? It's kind of cool, but I don't know, maybe it's a Bronco, maybe a Blazer or something. Right. Um, and just a little bit of history. So as John's taking us through his, his his pedigree in the international harvester world, particularly in the scouts, like John literally helped write the book. Yeah, on I co-wrote scouts. the book. So he co-wrote this book, the, um, the International Scout Encyclopedia. And this is a wonderful book. So if you have any interest in, in international, but particularly in scouts, check this out. It's in there. The models, the, it's amazing. the history, the where it started from. It's very well um, done. How it's, it was designed. It's uh, on our coffee table in my house and so many people come and we love looking at it. So thank you for doing that. It took us that. three years to write this book. And I do, as we start into this journey, I, as someone who, that has made, like provided for my family for the last 15 years from International Scouts, I have to thank you for your work. We have and, that in common. Yeah. Because that's my living too. I but started. you helped pave the way, man. So, Let's do two things. So okay. let's talk about the scout. Let's just kind of run through the scout, but then let's also talk through what the unique and influential and powerful role that you've played in preserving them. Because you you actually bought or started a thing called Scout Lightline, right? Which kept parts coming, kept them on the road. And so let's go back and let's let's just talk about the scout. So okay. What was kind of, how did it come to be? What year are we talking? What, when, when did Scouts, what was some of that early, pr- Scouts came out in 1961. Correct. To the public. Right. But what was behind the scenes happening in the late 50s? That, it was kind of a phenomenal because uh, a group of international harvester executives were in California and they saw some off-road vehicles. I don't know if what they were, military, could have been Willys yeah. Jeeps, yep, I don't yep. know what, but they came back uh to fort wayne indiana where the design center is and uh, got a hold of ted ornos who was the head designer and said we want you to design something to replace the horse wow yeah and interesting and he, this is in the late 50s that's 59 59 okay. he sat down at his kitchen table and scratched out a design or picture of what he thought which some of those be. drawings are in this book they're in the book i love that and two years that's impressive from drawing to tooling that scout was uh, put on the line December of 61. One of the things we talk about or is 60. a lot in this podcast is this concept of going from dream to dirt. Like how do you go just as a, as a man, you go like, Hey, I want to get out and have some adventure. And you go like, well, I'm going to get a scout and go do it. So that, that, what is the motivation? What is, what is the thing that inspires you? So two years from two years from drawing in, to, to in a production is amazing because incredible. the scout too. They started that concept in 65. Really? Six years later, wow. it came out. Wow. So quite a difference. And, and it's and changing honestly, technology. And too. they nailed it, man. The yeah. first scout. So let's also, let's set it, let's situate it in context. So in 1959, 
Mm-hmm. There was no Bronco. No. There was no Blazer. Nope. There was a Suburban. Yes. There was Travelalls. Yes. Do you know, I'm not a big Toyota guy, but when did the, do you know when the FJ40 came out? I'm not up on that. Okay. I'm not sure. But I think... So, what there was was the Willys. That's CJ right. CJ2A. Yeah. And those. See, would the CJ5 I think out? it would have been a CJ5 in like 64, so 65. That's what was out there, and it was not anything. It was not the sports utility that the Scout was. Yeah, and oftentimes, I think, I think to the normal guy in the street, the Bronco gets kind of the cred for like being the first sport utility vehicle, but it, it was the Scout. Well, it was the the Scout. Well, to be fair, like maybe the Jeep Wagoneer, because like Jeep Wagoneers came out in sixty. You no, know, they came out in sixty six. Yeah, but no, fifty nine. The, the maybe. Scout was a total. I mean, total totally different. The, right. the Bronco was a total rip off of the Scout right. by Ford. Right. They right down to. I mean, I had engineers that I'd talked to that said it was almost down to the centimeter. Right. They copied the, everything. Yeah. So I can't give them credit for the no, SUV. No, no, no. Of course not. Of course not. And then um, the Blazer was a full-sized vehicle. Because so. Bronco came out in 66. Yes. So that's obviously enough time to be inspired. Right. right. <laughs> and, 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 and more they just than basically inspired. copied. Right. Um, and International Harvester took a different approach because you could... That's all right. You could, you could literally order the Scout with no doors, no top. That's right. No back seat. Right. Right? So it was like, a utility vehicle. That's yeah. the utility part, in my opinion. Removable top, removable doors... Uh, full top, you know. In in the sixty one, that they came out right out the gate with the half cab and the full top and the full top. Right? Did they have any soft top options that early? They did. Yeah, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And they had like a high dome soft top. They did. Too, and they had like a half cab. Yeah. Deal. So, so cool so, stuff, yeah. man. The, it's like the stuff of dreams. Oh yeah. Um, and they so, were very basic vehicles. Yeah, they came. Just, so six. So now we're sixty one. It launches to the public, and it is called what is it called? The Scout. Scout 80, or was it just called the Scout? It was called Meet the Scout. Meet the Scout. Right. Okay, love it. And not too many people know this, but and I actually learned it from you in the book. Because I, I wondered forever, like, why did they call it a, a Scout 80? And why did they call it a Scout 800? I don't know. It was just model designations. But wasn't like, it, like, had to do with, like, the load-carrying capacity or something? Like, it was, like, an 800-pound. Yeah, for, like, half-ton yeah. type. Um, right. That's true. So, so... 61 to 65 is called the Scout or the Scout 80. Scout 80 is the model. The model. And they had only one engine. Basically the 152. 152, one transmission. Right. One, the T93 speed. Pretty much. And uh, Dana 27 front axle. Correct. And then in the first two or three years, it was just a Dana 27 rear axle. Pretty weak, though. Right. Um, and what I loved about the, the early Scouts is if you kept them as they were designed and engineered, like if you didn't put bigger tires on them, they would actually hold up and they oh, were yeah, durable. very well. But the second, like as in the 60s, what, what Scout created was, well, helped create was the people going off-road and exploring and adventuring. Right. And then they go, oh, let's put, get bigger, a little brittle. Let's put bigger, fatter tires on it. And then all of a sudden the 27 is breaking. So probably, in, I think in 63, they came out with the Dana 44 rear axle. Right. Um, so that's doing great. Do you know, off, I know it's like putting you on the spot, but do you know how many roughly they sold of that 61 to 65? Oh, that would have been, I think the first year was 28,000. Okay. So that's, that's successful. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It was it was a bumper crop, as they say, yeah. for so a vehicle. They didn't expect it. Didn't expect it. And then they kept a good thing rolling. 66 rolls along. They, they envisioned this Scout 800, which is... Uh, to the to the untrained eye, virtually identical in appearance. Pretty much, they just updated some features and comfort features and badging and different things. It wasn't a whole lot different. Right, the dash right. upgrade, and uh, but they also did something v- really special. I think to compete with the Bronco in '66, or I, I wonder who kind of chicken or the egg, but they came out with the V8. V8, yes, which is a game changer. Right, um, and also in '66, a four-speed. Right. And a four-speed in the four-cylinder edition. So now right. we have... And then, and then they had the twi- twin stick. Yes, 66, 67. And it's really fun, you guys. Like, one fun little... As uh, my son is 14, and we're here at the Nationals, and it's one of my favorite things to do is go like, okay, what year is this Scout? And you just... It, like, man, in yeah. 61 and 62, they had clear marker light lenses. Right. Six, and the heater boxes on the driver's side. 
63 it changes amber lenses like you can decipher quite a bit of things sure. through little subtle cues um and that's a lot of fun so 66 rolls around we now have this v8 scout 800 with a dana 44 rear still a dana 27 front but now it's like it's getting refined and what's interesting right. is like the marketing starts shifting right they, they come out with a sport top and yeah which is like you know, a luxury tried to dress them up with different packages like the red carpet special and yeah well, that's cool you know, that was things that's like cool that model. the uh, uh champagne yeah colors and those are pretty pulsary. rare yeah um and what i noticed from looking just at like i love looking at old ads like scout ads because you see like now they're marketing to moms right a lot business. of females in the ads yeah right. which is cool and a lot of uh business like business people right um it's kind of it's kind of pretty cool um and again, do you have any clue? Did production stay kind of stable, or did it go up or down? It was up and down. Up and down. Yeah. Um, but largely, probably consistent overall. Yeah, so we're it was talking, always consistent. We're talking a ten-year production, roughly. Let's just say conservatively, twenty-five thousand per year. That's about a good average. So is that two? Is my math right? Two hundred fifty thousand vehicles. It's a. There were five hundred and some five hundred thousand total. So yeah, that's wow. about right. This is this both is two stuff. and yes, yes, yeah. Scout eight, the first. Okay, generation. so you said in '66. Now something happens, and how, how is it going at, at internationals? It, it's going well. They're doing okay. They've got the travel on. Their bigger trucks are doing well too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so and they had a whole line. Yeah, and we're talking about the Scouts because that's what's most popular. But some of their literature said most complete line. Yeah. So they went from the Scout clear to these these uh, oil filled behemoth trucks. Huge. That is, that's actually something that. And Chevy had some bigger trucks and Ford, but but International had like from semis, like That's full right. out everything. Everything. Um, and what is the distinction? One is so describe to us what is the light line. Light line would be Scout up to like a one ton fifteen hundred. Okay. Like, pickup. Okay. Flatbed dually, which is cool. Um, and in the pickup trucks, a little different beast, but they stopped manufacturing the pickup trucks and the travelalls. In what year? 75. 75. Was the last. And they, About May. May of 75. Funny, we know, uh, what was his name? I know Nick Foster had it for a while, and he sold it to, what's the guy's name that has the last 1980? Oh, uh, Lynn Faith, I believe, has the last uh, truck. Truck, but Mike Bolton has the Mike last Bolton, scout. That's right. Yeah. And it's cool. I've seen the guy that Lynn got, I think, got the last truck from. His name is Nick. Um, I've seen it super cool and yeah, the last scout it's pretty neat and i've heard mike is restoring the last scout. he's doing a ground up on the last scout yes but like keeping it out like all everything respected that's awesome um so 66 some things come around the market they're trying to keep up with the market and doing a good job that the 8800 was a great vehicle one shift like scout 80s the windshield folded down right kind of back to the probably the jeep inspiration sure and then Six, they quit that yeah in 66 now the windshield is fixed Although we've seen some, they That's snuck right. through. They snuck through. I, I've heard a story, because a friend of mine had a 69 Scout 800 with a fold-down windshield, and he said it was like a Forest Service, like some of the national parks and Forest Service special ordered those. Right. I don't know if that's true. Possibly some military, too. Yeah, military. And yeah, like you see scouts at airports at this yep. time. Yep. Um, you ever see those big old travel halls with like the eight doors oh, on yeah. them? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Dog Day Afternoon was a movie that had one of those. <laughs> okay. Um so 66 rolling around the engineers are like what's next so what are they what is that what are they working on well i was like i mentioned they the sport top and they came out with special models and uh little improvements here and there but they also like much. you said earlier they started designing the scout too oh that started in 65 65 okay yeah, clay models i've got pictures of those there's some of those are in the book that's crazy uh, on the scout too and uh it took them until 71 to get it out yeah. And then I remember when the Scout 2 did come out, there were dealers that wanted them to keep both lines. Oh, all really? for the economy, Scout 800. Really? Because they were cheaper. Yeah. The Scout 2 was uh, technical, you know, technically a better, not a better, but a, right. a more expensive so, design. So, yeah. So, so, so it was $1,000 more. That's right. And we talk a lot about, uh, and in our business, we focus a lot on drivability. And when you talk right. about a Scout 800 only ever came with drum brakes right no power steering never had power steering um big vacuum old, light uh, yeah wipers vacuum wipers yeah. um just very very simple 
the Scout Two revolutionized all that. Yes. Basically, they're quieter. Yes, more comfortable. Like they have uh, wider leaf springs, longer right. leaf springs, so they ride better. It's much better design. Yeah, um, they leak less. They leak. I mean, anything <laughs> with a right. removable top is right. going to leak. Of course, um, but now it's. But even in seventy one, we have a couple. A couple things shifted. Actually, we should just mention in nineteen sixty nine, a new engine is offered. The six-cylinder, right. 232 right. AMC six-cylinder. Became standard. Yeah, so now we have the 196, the V8 304 at this time. Right. Like 69, 70, and the 232. That's Correct. it, right? Right. And also we have the introduction of automatics. Right. In the what? Borg Warner. Was that in 69 or 70? I believe it's 69. Yeah. So now we have a really kind of cool vehicle in that we can have automatic and then we're comfortable never had ac although they did have dealership options there was an add-on unit yeah like a yes. mark four i've seen a few yep. of them um so you're getting into some refinement but then the scout 2 comes ac is very easy easy right. and common cruise control it's an option yes uh, cruise control power steering uh torque flight transmissions came in a little later better transmission yeah, yeah, yeah. than the borg warner was that by like 71 72 uh 72? no it would have been 73 and four really yeah. that the, the they got the rid borg, of the borg warner yes what do you and think about disc brakes. What do you think about the Borg Warner? It's not a very good transmission. Yeah. No. It's like a cast iron removable bell housing right. weird. Yeah, it's pretty electric kick yeah. down switch. And it does it does it's kind of a hard shift. Yeah. Versus right. the the uh, smoothness of the torque flight. Which smart for my age to partner oh, yeah. kind of with that Mopar design sure. of the tor- of the torque flight seven twenty seven, which they use behind Hemis and like it's a great transmission. Right. Oh, it's great. Um, Still today. That's right. And so seventy one comes around, the Scout two is born. Do you know or have you ever heard of the last Scout 800? No. Same here. What happened to that puppy? Or the first Scout Mm. 2 either. We don't know much about them. Do you know? Tell tell us a little bit about the 810. Well, that would have been the the person, the uh, design, excuse me, the designation for the project for the Scout 2. Okay. So. So so yeah, because there's some like there's some differences. Those very first, maybe the first six months of '71, like the glove box has a push button, right. the VIN plates in a different spot. Right. Those were eight, pretty much considered eight tens. Yeah, the shifter. Oh, like right. you ever see those the Borg Warner shifters are real funky right. for the Scout twos. Right. Um, and then they dropped that. Then Just they dropped it. A Scout two. And big announcement in '73 or '74 was the first year for disc brakes, or was it '73? '74. '74. Now we have power steering. Power disc brakes. That's right. Um, a Dana 44 front axle. Right. 71 through 73 would only be Dana 30s. 30. With a full flanged axle, sure. 44 rear. Um, so now we're getting some sophistication, some Absolutely. real capability. Some um, comfort. The seats were better. You had I'll bench you, and bucket. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the colors, the red in, in a 70, you know, the early 70s Scout 2 with the red interior, I think it's one of the best looking. They're amazing. And then they went away. What's funny to me is like, I always joke about this because International had some like pretty wild like yeah. design. Whoever was pulling the pulling the levers on like, let's do, like I had a truck come in the other day that was like, like a fire orange, something, something like an almost like an orange, but with a red interior, original. Or like you see like a green dash with a brown plaid seat, like a russet mm-hmm. plaid. Like they just did some kind of wild, yeah, yeah they mismatchy some, color stuff, which made them kind of cool. In it my was seventies. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then they go kind of unchanged from seventy four. I mean, grills changed. The biggest change was when they dropped the light line. The travel all went away, and then yes. in seventy six they came out with the traveler. That is huge. Matera. Thank you for big mentioning change. It. Big big addition. Diesel too. came out that year. First American passenger car with a diesel. Wow. And they so, use a Nissan SD33. Right. Non-turbo until 80. You like them? I have had a couple that ran pretty good. Okay. Yeah, they, they're like... They're, but you don't want to rent, you know, you're not going to win any races. That's right. And I've, I've kind of found, some people will tell you, and I, I, I don't have a reason to not believe them. Like, oh, I got 400,000 miles on my SD33. I'm like, that's surprising to me because I've seen Usually so they many... Usually crack heads. cracked heads. Right. right. They're, like, so I said, they're like... Durable but fragile. If you overheat right. them, you're cracking ahead, and it's. But if they're well maintained, that's right. They'll go forever. They'll go forever. Yeah. And like you said, underpowered. And then in '79, they offered that SD33T with a turbo. It's really eighty. Oh, okay. there was yeah, a few '79s okay, okay. that slipped through, but most Got of them it. were okay. 1980, one year, which helped. Right. Um, oh, it helped quite a bit. 
So let's talk about the what is the Terra and the Traveler? What what, what are those? Basically, a stretched 118 uh, inch, 118 inch uh, version of the Scout Two. Uh, the Terra was a fiberglass half cab with a tailgate, and it had uh, they'd move the bulkhead back on the pickup to give you more sp- yes space behind nice the seat. Move. Right. Yeah, and uh, added a fiberglass top and a tailgate, and it, it was. To replace the basically the full size pickup that they just dropped. Super. Oh, that, that makes that makes. I never That's thought what it about was that. for. That's so yeah, weird. Absolutely. I've been in this game for a long time, and I never thought about you that. Learned, you didn't read the book. <laughs> I, read the book. I should have. Read, you, you saw it, but you don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that is interesting. And the yeah. Terras are rad, and they're super cool in my opinion. Um, right. Same with the Traveler. The Traveler was replaced the Travelall. Yeah. Travelall was a one nineteen inch wheelbase. Your Traveler was one eighteen with a full fiberglass top yes. and a hatchback. I love them. So, and what's weird to, in today's market, still the unsung heroes are the travelers and terrors. They are. They don't get the credit they, they deserve. They don't get the credit, man. They're no. they're awesome. A Especially lifted, for, nice looking traveler can bring a lot of eyes. So let's talk also like some part aftermarket partnerships. Uh, they came out with some kind of cool. There was some in the scouts. So tell us about the Midas edition. Midas was a van conversion company that took them and put swivel buckets and shag carpet and uh, sunroofs and, and really dulled them up. So Midas would probably order them direct from IH with no seats or whatever, maybe a basic. Midas would, would they would market them to the dealers. The dealers would order them and they go to Midas. Got it. Get done then delivered to the dealers. So, so they, they had were, to market them first. Got it. But my, the Midas Edition Scouts were sold directly through Scout dealers. Correct. The cool. brochure is through IH. And they had like some pretty funky shag carpet, really, Swivel really... Swivel buckets, sunroofs. Yeah. Little clock, up, you know, oh, digital cool. clock up above. Yeah. Uh, little coolers with the oh, console yeah? coolers. I don't know yeah. if I've seen one yeah. of those. And like pretty uh, bold plaids. Like, I mean, they're, yeah. they scream it was 70s. very 70s. And they had... But in uh, like bucket middle seats as well, right? That reclined and had armrests. That was kind of cool. Some that turned, and then also in the back, now we a have third the, seat in a traveler, third seat, which is, was very well received. I agree with, with larger families, and it folded down flat so you could haul your plywood or whatever. Yeah, so also. I, have, I have four kids, and my dad, uh, when he passed away, he left me his traveler, which it was a Midas edition, and so. My whole my all my kids were all raised driving around driving to California, all around the West Coast, East Coast, everywhere in my Scout Traveler in the, that tiny little back seat. Oh yeah, and, uh, good memories. No oh, AC, yeah. just kids sweating like <laughs> sweating bullets, getting <laughs> windows tough. down. That's right, man. Um, now, did yours have the side windows in the back? The what sliding. Yes, sliding See, windows. That was something that was uh, uh, a nice refinement. Yes. Was that that option? I like just they just kept making them better, man. Yeah, they were, they came up with some things. Yeah, and the ACs, I don't know. Luggage I like rack. Them. Yeah, luggage you rack, know, super cool. Stuff like that. And then one little fun hack is like cuz one bummer about the traveler top is it's a it's a lift gate. Right. So when you take the top off, you have no tailgate. Right. So yeah, you they can, put a tailgate from a pickup on it. Yeah, and so we've done it a couple of times at the shop in the old days where you essentially cut the lift the traveler top to, and make a seal sure. and latch system. Right. Kind of cumbersome. But I also just had a spare uh, tailgate laying around. Um, okay, so now we're rolling in. How is uh, the market? So there's another book that's out there that I partially read. I'm a partial guy sometimes oh, yeah. when reading. But it's called International Harvester, A Corporate Tragedy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what is, help us understand. So Scouts stopped. The last Scout was produced in October of 1980. 21, October 21. October 21. Yep. So what happened? Like from this 1959, like this booming market, they come on the scene. By 1980, they're done. Well, there was EPA problems. Um, they couldn't meet the CAFE standards. Mm. and That's like the emissions and stuff? Right. And when you mentioned corporate tragedy, over International Harvester in a whole had problems. Uh. They had All their divisions were fighting over... Uh, like fa- agriculture versus truck versus construction, fighting over uh, resources for development of new product. Yes, to keep them going, and the, there was a gas sh- shortage, kind of in the late '80s, and yes. then they had a strike in November of '79 through about April. It was about six months. International 80, Harvester had a strike. They struck 
and they weren't building uh, any scouts. They weren't building any I pickups. Didn't know that. Nothing. That pretty much spelled the end. And it just hit them hard. It hit now, them very hard. Th- is that any of the same context that happened with the with the canceling of the pickups and the travel alls in '75? Sort of the same because the '75 there was a, definitely a gas crunch. Yeah, and got it. There were the travel alls and pickups did use a lot of gas. But it's and weird because like the sub- the suburban endured. I mean, that might be the only large. Chevrolet vehicle. was a bigger company with deeper pockets. Yep. they could. Tough I don't it wouldn't out. call it dead weight, but they could pull along. And what's interesting, bigger John, vehicles like that. Like you're bringing you're making me think, because from '73 the suburban remained unchanged through yeah. 1991. So I think that builds your case to say like, the, they, they were Chevy had the deep pockets to pull that old to keep that old model kind of pulling along through right. that gas crisis and. And now, like, Suburbans are, like, everyone, like, Ford Excursions, right, Suburbans, right. Dodge has, like, everyone's got They big missed out junk. on the travel all, the big stuff. I know, dude, travels are and awesome. I will mention the 6.9 diesel that came out on the Ford yeah. in 84 would have revolutionized full-size international know, trucks. They just... It's too bad. And they got out of the scout well. game too early. In my opinion. Because SUVs, as we know, took that's right. right off. I have... You're getting a get there. I have a 91 Suburban. Mm-hmm. That's, like, now our family driving route. Sure. Um, and I've had travel like 74 and 75 travel alls. And in my opinion, the travel alls are built superior. Oh, yeah. Heavy. Metal's thicker. Right. They're heavy, man. I had a four door just pickup truck cab only, no fenders, just the cab with doors on it. And that sucker took like 10 people to lift this. They're oh, heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were well, very well made. Okay, so we're rolling around, but there was like a, the next model being planned. Yeah, I guess they had numbers, 350, 400. They were going to be more luxurious versions of the Scout, and they might not even have used the Scout But what name. was like that, the, the weird-looking composite Scout? Oh, the SSV. The SSV. That was going to be a supplemental. Oh, it was. Yeah, that's not a that. replacement. Okay. That would have been like a Jeep Liberty yeah. or some other So that's a big misnomer because a lot of people think that that is a no problem. Man. This guy's a busy guy. A lot of people, John puts on this show, so like he's at the center. So Sorry. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. This is educating a lot of sure. people, which is and I don't really mind. cool. Really cool. Um, okay, so 1980, October comes around, strike, bam, scouts done. So then what happens? Like we have all these scout owners of Rusty Scouts. <laughs> they had a pretty revolutionary warranty in 80, which was five years, 100,000 miles. Okay. Unheard of in the industry. Unheard of. And they kept. They honored that. Because back in the day, man, a lot of cars had 100,000 miles. They were kind of clapped out. So you could say up till 85, the Scouts were being brought back into the dealership and quarters put on. Yeah, really? Clark, oh, it, was, it was a rust. Five-year, 100,000 miles. Wow. Yeah, think about it. He bought an 80. You had to deal 85 to claim your warranty. That's crazy. So, yeah, they... Uh, probably, they probably hated it, the, the higher ups. Like <laughs> no, when they were done with the Scout, they were really done. Okay. So now, if so, now let's say it's 1987, and you have a scout. How do you find parts? Dealers weren't wanting to mess with them anymore. A lot of them. There were some core dealers that did, but most of your dealers wanted to cater to the medium and medium and heavy trucks. So, um, and the aftermarket companies like your company and mine hadn't sprung up yet. No, and so, it, one interesting other little context. When I like talk to some old timers and stuff. Um, when you think of a dealership today, you think of this really big building that they have three or four hundred cars on the lot. But back then, you could like, you might have an implement dealer that sold combines right. and things, and they just had four or five scouts, and that right. was considered a scout dealer. Right, exactly. And they might have some replacement parts. Right. So through the '80s, those people start liquidating inventory. Right. So you come on the scene. Tell us about how did you come to? Well, I started Sonoff. working at a dealership in 1984. Okay. After high school, um, I started catering to scout people over the counter and put an ad in Four Wheeler Magazine for some reason because my brothers and I like to take them apart and part them out. Even in that, but this early. is still this you're is working, 84. But you're working at it. So I'm at a truck dealership in Columbus, Ohio. So I bet this this truck dealership started getting a reputation. They did. These are the guys to go they to. Did. For scout. That's I, cool, man. I got the calls. I, I uh, delivered the parts, uh, and then I had a catalog, first yeah. catalog ever done. Wow. And I uh, Now, International started, Harvester was 
or the dealerships you worked for was obviously probably grateful to you because you're bringing in I was all bringing this in business money yeah and, and an extra income but it was i was focusing on scout and they they were medium and heavy too so got it that waned on them after a while and i started wholesaling oh to you did get it. them up wow. scout to yeah. scout connection yeah what were the first kind of get them up get them up scout rod, right scout connection lent the faiths yes okay um, scout works there were some others that aren't around yeah, anymore like, yeah I wholesaled to all those people. Interesting. So if you think about it, my numbers, uh, part numbers and all that, for scout parts being flowed through one dealer really stood out. For sure. So in 88, 89, when they decided, okay, 10 years is coming up, we need to get out of this, they looked at my numbers, they contacted me about buying out the scout lightline business. And my partner at the time... Rod Phillips would get him up scout. And how old of a dude were you at this time? 28 years old. That's amazing, man. Like such an entrepreneurial perspective on like, because all there was, there was undoubtedly a ton of parts, like hundreds of we parts. We cleaned ca- out all the warehouses. Okay. So then you so started. Semi trucks arrived with man. all the inventory. We had a warehouse in Colorado and then of course in Springfield. And we're talking about all the good, like goodies. Metal, stuff, like quarters and dash fenders pads. and dash pads. Oh. Well, wasn't any dash pads. Okay. <laughs> a, lot of it, a lot of it was already gone. Okay, yeah. But there was good stuff. I mean, you know, the original motor mounts with the, yep. with the bolt, there was skids of them. Man, and because there, there had to be a movement in the mid 80s when when people knew. Like I, I got, I love, I love my Scout, I got two or three of them. And they started going into their local dealers and just buying stuff up. Right. Because you still, today, you see like older, like you might be an older guy that passes away and in his garage, he's just got all these NOS light parts. Right, they bought them up. Yeah. And a lot of the dealers were dumping the stuff, so they would buy them and just put put parts away. So, entrepreneur, you're rolling this thing out. 88, they contact you, International Harvester. And Rod and I decided to keep light line separate. And wholesale only, so we would have a level playing field with yeah. all the other players. Cool. And so we only sold to the maybe a dozen independent dealers and across then, the country. Across the country, and then any Navistar dealer. Oh, okay. Could order, and okay. they still can. Yep. Today. That's interesting. But I didn't not know many that. do. Yeah. And this is way pre-internet. Oh, this is yes. Paper catalog. Paper catalog. Power of a telephone. A telephone. A rotary. And phone. fax machine. Yeah. Remember what those were? And we're talking rotaries, right? Yeah. No, they were still push okay. buttons. Okay, <laughs> um, And so now it's so you have you st- when did you start Super Scout Specialist? Okay, so Super Scout was started at, at Center City International, the dealer. It was, okay, it, oh, the catalog okay. was Super Scout slash really? Center City International trucks. Okay. When the light line thing came along, the owner of that branch had a chance to be in on it, and, mm-hmm. but he just didn't he didn't see it, man. See it? Yeah. It gave his blessing for me to take Super Scout with me in the light line thing, only separate. Yes. Rod and I agreed, get them up Scout, and Super Scout would be remain separate, light line the wholesale entity yes. between us. And you stayed fair. in Ohio. And it's still that way. Yes, and you stayed in Ohio. And yes, it, he was in Colorado. In Colorado. Yeah. Um, and how, like, just, this is just a, an interesting demographic question. How did your businesses, how did like the, the retail businesses do? Because Ohio, ton, there's tons of scouts in the Midwest. Well, we did very well. And, the and there's tons of scouts in Colorado. That's right. And we did, we had, I wouldn't say a lot of walk-in trade, but a lot of it was phone and mail order. And then in 1990, we started the Scout Nationals. Oh, really? So, I, I didn't know it was that yeah, early. Yeah, 1990 was the first wow. year. So that started the glue for all of this. Wow. Pretty much. Yeah. And from the Nationals... All the regional shows began, came from that. And I think, so um, New Legend, as you guys know, New Legend, New Legend was birthed out of anything Scout. Correct. Which is anything Scout is Scout community, Scout parts. Like it's all, it's all about international Scouts primarily. I'm, I, I don't deal a ton in like pickups, travel alls. We, sure. we love them, but we've just. Right. Fit, your your bread so, and butter is the Scout. Yeah. And 80 to 2. Um, but Jim Marsh. Like Rod was kind of a mentor to Jim Marsh in the early '90s. He was one of our dealers, and he started when anything Scout started in '91 or '93, someone in somewhere in there. I think he said. I'd have to look that up. Yeah, but it had to be early. And 90s. he was out on the West Coast, correct? And I have this banner from Jim. It's like the only authorized Lightline dealer in in California. California. He, he was proud of. He that. loved that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and trust me, he was proud of it when I had to pay when I had to pay for it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but interesting dude. Yeah, um, yeah, very. And I was fascinated. So when I drove my first Scout, I, I was a muscle car kid in Connecticut. Moved to California. And now we're in, this is 1993. And I drive my first Scout and I go, this is it, man. The perfect vehicle. It's It's got beautiful lines. It's not big like a Blazer because I had a Blazer growing up. And it was, they're just really big and wide. Cumbersome. And cumbersome. Scout's got like, and I remember seeing an ad, like a Scout has like a, as an eight foot tighter turning Crazy radius. Turning radius. Yeah. Yeah. Like so yeah. I drove and I'm like, nimble. This, this is awesome. So I bought my first Scout and then I was in the Bay Area. And so I met Jim and uh, <laughs> Wild Times, man. That was the old, that was the old Wild West and Scout oh, yeah. cars. Jim was something else. Yeah. Cause I was, I would call, I'd be like, Hey, I'm looking for a T19. You got one of these? He's like, yeah, I got one. Come on down. 300 bucks. And then I get there and he's like, 500 bucks. I'm like, dude, oh, you just boy. told me 300 bucks. What the <laughs> heck? Um, Jim was a character. Yeah. So and and what's crazy is like what I thought was crazy was at the time I bought the business in 2002 right late 2002 and he had told me at the time that he had personally scrapped like 700 scouts wow at least um that, that might be a exaggeration a little bit but it's possible it might be yeah but but so to those numbers and so, so I've always as I've thought about biz, our business and planning and I'm sure you have better data than me but I've just said, so let, I thought the numbers were 300,000 total scouts. So you're no, saying it's five. five. From 61 to 80. Right. So that's great information. Because we had a Polk report. Yeah. It was provided from Navistar. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and then I did the, I, I'm like, okay, let's say 300,000. Let's say 80, 70% rusted away and got scrapped. It's possible. But that still Doesn't leaves, leave many. That still leaves 30 to 40,000. Right. And for guys like you and me, if you sell three hundred dollars worth of parts to ten thousand scout owners, that's a pretty yeah. decent business. That's true. So that's what's so remarkable about I. And actually, my story, when I was going to buy anything scout, I went to the SBA. Mm -hmm. Their their retired executives to like have them watch my business plan or look just look over my business sure. plan. Sure. And they said this is a terrible business. Stay out of it because like they they said like there's not many of these left. This, this is a bad idea. And I said. I don't care what you say. I, I see it. I see what's happening. These things are cool. We got to keep them on the road. People love, there's passion. There's so much passion. Right. Um, and it's a funny joke. It's like, if you're a true scout fan, you don't just have one. Oh, and that's, that's so true. true. It's like, how many have you had? You've had probably. Well, they used to make fun of me at the parts counter when I worked at international dealer. I'd have six of them lined up and whichever one would start that morning is the one I'd drive. <laughs> that's funny. It was like, ha ha. Yeah, that's funny. And they love leaking oil, right? They mark the territory, of course. Like so, you've like, you've had them when they're pretty new. Did they leak yeah. when they were new? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an international. That's right. That's what they do. That's hard to convince people. Like when you're doing a restoration, it's gonna leak, and they spend good money, and then six months later it starts leaking. And they're like, I want to warranty this oil leak, and you're like, they just it's, did that when they were new. It, we're dealing with '60s technology here, and some of it or '50s technology. It's just yeah. the way it is. That's right. Okay. You can modernize as much as you can. So, Scout, unfortunately, went away in 1980. But now we have this robust community. We're celebrating 30 years. 30 years, right? Yep, of this show. At the Nationals. The community, in my opinion, is growing stronger and stronger. Absolutely. And what I see growing, percolating up, because our vision in 2003, that early, was because um, I kind of saw the the generational gap of the scouts. And I said, what I want to do is I want to bring the scout to a new generation of people. So people like, like to people that didn't, didn't grow up in the back of one. And there's still those, those deep connections. We have those, and we honor those, those customers. But what's so exciting is to see people who go, I, I saw it on Instagram and now, and now I have two of them and my kids love them. And it's like, my wife loves them. And it's, and what I see is all these, cool little communities popping up all over like there's a guy here that we're gonna have on the podcast tomorrow this guy mario from tennessee and nashville mm -hmm. and they have like a group of like 20 to 30 young scout owners that are just like young professionals lots that, of clubs out there yeah it's awesome and so um what is as we just kind of wrap up thank you so much for sharing oh, no this problem is, it's my pleasure and what i love is like I've been doing this for, to me, it seems like a long time, but you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was funny. I was, I was out with uh, one of this uh, scout guy, 
And he's been doing it for a long time too, Mike, out in Southern California, Ishmael. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And he's like, he said the same thing. He's like, man, I'm beat up. I've been parting out scouts my whole life. My back is shot. And so it's not an easy business always. Right. But it's very rewarding. And when you get to see awesome scouts like this and awesome people, there's such, there's such a great group of people. Everyone's friendly. Um, and it's just it's great. So I appreciate all, the, the, all that hard work of keeping this going, man. That's what I got to do. Because think about it. Without you, who knows? I don't know what would have happened. I don't know either. I think I think we, it would have been similar. Yeah. I hope. I, yeah, Somebody would have stepped up. I hope so. It wasn't me. But I appreciate your work and, and certainly your, uh, your role, even in an existential way of like, or somewhat removed way and in, in me being able to do what I love and, and provide for Trying my to be family. fair about it. Yeah. You know, nobody's king. No, you it's know, great. And we try to include as everybody that wants to be involved. It's great. So what is next? What's, what's kind of the next, uh, what's next for Lightline, for Super Scouts? What's next for John Glancy? It would be nice to come up with a front fender. Yes. Thank you. you know, I'll partner with you on that. Let's do that. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and you know, I that, other like, parts that we don't have, that's what we and need. And one thing I'm, I've been so thankful for is the like dog legs. Those yeah, are getting the, those you stamp did was, such a good job good. on those things. Thank you. Because we restore scouts every day. And my they're guy, perfect. They're perfect. And so... Um, we need a, to do more of that. A front fender would be... Uh, windshield insane. frames. Windshield front frames. Front fenders. Scout 80 fenders and quarters too. And I think I, mean, I think you're right, John. I think we have to like... Because it's not cheap. No. Like to do those dog legs... It, it, we're talking no. folks, if you look them up, like just look up scout They're expensive and we don't make much. So No. And they're, and they're like three inches by four inches. They're right. tiny. Right. But we're talking thousands and thousands and tens of thousands right. of dollars to sure. get them to get up the stamp and the tooling so to make like a fender is not a small be a hundred thousand dollars it was at least it you know in the past 10, 10 years i've looked at it and it's usually a minimum of 10 grand or a hundred grand 100, to get hundred thousand tooling done and my hope is the technology has changed that we may be able to uh get that price down yeah what's interesting i'm working on because like we love the the rally steering wheels mm-hmm. that's like what we're using all of our builds and like the plastic parts are just getting impossible, so right. we're actually getting stuff, some stuff three D printed. That's cool. Um, we've we we've got the horn button uh, retainers, and yes, and, and I get we have the button done. You did, okay? I did, but it would wouldn't click on. Mm. So I'm trying to get the guy to remold them. You had a mold done. I did. We did, awesome. but we didn't want to put them out when they didn't click. You know, they just go no, on there. No, you can't. can't. That's cool. So let me know how that goes because I, I might help you. I got to get on that guy about redoing that. Yeah, and if it takes like, hey, so say, Let's Sean, go. order a hundred of these. That might happen. I might do it. A little more of that would help us. Yeah, it would. And thanks for all your work. No thanks problem. for keeping these things on the road, man. It's been fun. Um, we're gonna keep keep it going, man. We're gonna keep going. It's we're not ending. Fun. The show is going biannual. We're off next year, but okay. we're, we're not done. We'll be back in twenty one. I think that's helpful because there's the retool, so much stuff going on. Judging and all this is yeah. going to get changed. Good, and we're going to be more relaxed. That's what it's we want. It's already pretty relaxed, but I like. But I like it. You haven't been in the judging part. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, we're, it's like a Corvette show. Yeah, it's just we too complicated. That. that needs to go away. And one request from a builder. Okay, is let's add a driving portion. That oh boy, they had that at Fort Wayne. Because they had the test track. No, not just. I'm saying judging in the judging. Oh, that you have so to. These three trucks give you Should the keys be. and go. You go drive. Oh, them. okay. I'll be the first one. Because we have like our, our new legend yeah. motto is sure. the best driving vintage 4x4s on sure. the planet. <laughs> so we'll look into that. We'll look into it. John, cool. thanks again. No problem. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Until next time. Take it easy.